Hello, friends. Uh, welcome to our next session on Survey of Theology. Uh, this is going to be lesson number six uh, in our series, and today we are going to talk about God the Son, His Ascension, and Priestly Ministry, and we are also going to talk about His coming for His saints. His coming for His saints. So let me go ahead and jump into the notes here. Now, after His resurrection, which uh, we had discussed uh, last session, after his resurrection, Jesus ascended bodily uh, into heaven. And I'm going to make an emphasis of that because he ascended bodily and he is going to return bodily from heaven. But in Mark 16, 19, it says, So then, when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. In Luke chapter 24, verses 50 and 51, it reads, And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, notice what the text says, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And so this is his bodily ascension. As, a, as an aside here, notice verse 52, And they, after worshiping him, now, earlier I had talked about uh, passages that demonstrate Jesus as God, as deity. And, of course, only God can receive and should receive worship. Well, clearly they worship him. They worship uh, Jesus. And so, again, another a passage demonstrating his, uh, his divine nature. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, Luke tells us here, it says, And after he had said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So they, so Jesus here is his bodily ascension, and the disciples here, the apostles, are able to see him with their eyes. They're watching him ascend. And of course, we don't know the pace at which he's ascending, but he is ascending, and he's getting smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually he is out of their sight. Notice verse 10, And as they were gazing intently into the sky, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside him. And I take this to be two angels. And they also said, uh, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you bodily, been taken up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. Well, he ascended bodily. He will return bodily. And this is important because there are some uh, uh, cults who teach that Jesus has already returned spiritually. And, and again, this information is very helpful because when they come knocking at your door uh, and they want to say, oh, well, Jesus has already returned. He's already come back. Uh, you say, oh, really? And, uh, and they're going to say, oh, yeah, his uh, return was a spiritual return. Well, then you have the means here to refute that. <clears throat> so the biblical record, and so one has to ask, okay, well, where is Jesus right now? And, of course, we're talking about it from the dispensation of the church age. Where is Jesus right now? Well, right now he is in heaven. That is his location. And when I use the term heaven... Uh, I'm thinking about the place where God resides, uh, where his throne is, uh, where the angels reside. Uh, what Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 calls the third heaven. Now, my best understanding of that is that when we think about the first heaven, it would be the atmosphere around the planet where the birds fly. The second heaven would be the universe itself. The third heaven is beyond that. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's the place where God resides, where Jesus currently is located. And so Jesus is right now in heaven. Acts chapter 2, verses 32 to 35 tell us, again, this is Luke who wrote the book of Acts, tell us, it says, This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. And don't miss that, because when we're talking about the biblical record, we are talking about 
men who saw, who walked with Jesus, who knew him, who heard his words, who saw his miracles, and who has recorded these things for us. And this is what we're looking at when we look at the Gospels and the book of Acts and the New Testament. We are looking at a written record of, uh, of what they heard and what they saw. And so they were, they were all witnesses. And so they're testifying as witnesses. Verse 33, therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having uh, received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, uh, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. And notice verses 34 and 35. It says, for, uh, for it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And in Acts chapter 7, verses 55 and 56, this is when Stephen uh, was being martyred after he had delivered his wonderful, wonderful message. It says, But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing. Now that's interesting because uh, in the other passages, it has Jesus uh, being seated next to the right hand of the Father, but here it has Jesus standing. And it's thought that Jesus here is standing, as it were, in approval of Stephen, who is conducting himself most magnificently, just absolutely magnificently. He's being, he's being persecuted. He's about to be the first martyr. And it's almost as though Jesus is standing to receive him into heaven. And so a very interesting picture here, but Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So again, we have Jesus in heaven. That is his current location. And in verse 56, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And so that is where Jesus is currently residing. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, which says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, in heaven, and that is the place from which uh, we eagerly await uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10, For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, to wait for his Son from heaven. So again, notice this, to wait for his son from heaven, because that's what we're waiting for. We are waiting for the return of Christ. We are waiting for the return of Christ, but he is currently in heaven right now. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. And 1 Thessalonians 4.16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven, from heaven, uh, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will uh, rise first. But we have here the Lord himself will descend from heaven because that is his current location, his current location. Now, Jesus went up to heaven bodily, and he will return the same way uh, when he comes back to establish his kingdom. Now, now, in the Revelation 19, that is his coming with his saints. That is his coming with his saints. So the first coming uh, is going to be what we understand to be the rapture of the church, and this is Jesus coming for his saints. And so we are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and then we will go with him uh, to heaven. Uh, and then at his second coming, he will... Uh, come back with his saints in this in, in order to establish his kingdom upon the earth. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. But the point me, uh, being is, again, that Jesus currently is in heaven. That is his location. Now, the ascension of Jesus into heaven signaled the end of his ministry on earth. And Jesus had a ministry upon the earth. Now, he came in hypostatic union, up. Uh, uh, that he was born of the Virgin Mary, Parthenogenesis, and Mary was Christotokos, remember? And so uh, he is born, he comes into the world, he grows, but then at a point in time, uh, he begins his ministry, which went for a little over three years. 
And that was his time of ministry, and that began at the time uh, of his uh, baptism, in which he was baptized by John the Baptist, and that until uh, the time of his ascension. So the ascension of Jesus into heaven signaled the end of his ministry on earth. Uh, So Jesus had come to earth originally to offer the Davidic kingdom to Israel. He had come to offer the Davidic kingdom to Israel. And when we think about the Davidic kingdom, when we think about the kingdom offer, we should understand it as an earthly kingdom, as an earthly kingdom. And so, for example, when you look at 2 Samuel chapter 7, Uh, here God is talking to David. He says, when your days are completed and you lie down with your fathers, speaking of David's death, I will raise up a descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. And here he's talking about Solomon and he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne. And notice, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Solomon was not a forever person, but, but God here is promising that the throne of David will be a forever person. Now, when you get down to verse 16, it says here, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. And so when we think of the kingdom that David had uh, as the king over the nation of Israel, we understand it to be an earthly kingdom. David was a, a literal, physical, historical person. And he sat upon a literal throne, and he ruled over a kingdom. And there was there were laws, uh, there were there was an economy, uh, there were uh, citizens, people to be ruled over. And so we think about uh, a literally an earthly kingdom or government. Maybe government might be a better word. And you say, well, Steve, the word uh, uh, covenant uh, isn't here, and this is the um, Davidic covenant. And it doesn't appear in 2 Samuel, but it does appear over in Psalm 89, where God says, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David, my servant. Now, the word covenant here translates the Hebrew word berith. By the way, covenant is just a, another word for a contract. That's what that is. Uh, and so they use the old word, but I, I sometimes I prefer the, the new word contract. And he says, and I will establish your seed forever and build up your throne to all generations. Selah. (coughs) Excuse me. And then in verses 34 through 36, God says, my covenant I will not violate, nor will I alter the utterance of my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His descendants shall endure forever and his throne as the sun before me. Notice Luke chapter 1, verses 30 to 33. The angel said to her, this is Gabriel speaking to Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. And he will be called, and he will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. Now, how would she have understood this? She would have understood this to be the literal throne of David, the, the place of rule. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. So, again here, when we think of Jesus when he first came, he came to offer the kingdom to Israel. In fact, this was his message in Matthew 4, 17. Uh, From that time, Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, this is the kingdom that comes from heaven, Uh, but it is nonetheless an earthly kingdom. And you think of even in the Lord's Prayer, when Jesus taught the uh, disciples to pray, they were to pray, thy kingdom come. Now, to pray thy kingdom come means that the kingdom's not here, uh, and they're to pray for it to come. And then he says, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so the the kingdom was to come, and it was to be an earthly kingdom. And even when Jesus sent the uh, disciples out in uh, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 through 7, uh, he tells them to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and then in verse 7, and as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So 
uh, when Jesus came uh, at his first coming, uh, when he came in hypostatic union upon the earth and walked among men, his ministry was to offer the Davidic kingdom to Israel. But that was rejected. And you can read about that in Matthew chapter 10, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 11 and 12, uh, most, chapter 12 most notably. And so after uh, Israel had rejected him, the Davidic kingdom was postponed. Was postponed. It will come. God's word cannot lie. He made a promise to David, 2 Samuel 7 uh, and Psalm 89 and Luke 130. And though the kingdom was offered, though the earthly kingdom of, was offered, it was rejected. And so it was postponed until his second coming. That's Revelation 19 and 20. Now, the prominent work of Christ in heaven right now, what is he doing? Okay, well, we know where he's at. We know that he's in heaven. What's he doing? Well, the prominent work of Christ in heaven is that of high priest. That of high priest. And the following four points here are taken directly from major Bible themes, uh, pages 72 to 74. So as high priest over the true tabernacle on high, the Lord Jesus Christ has entered into heaven itself there to minister as priest in behalf of those who are his own in the world. And so this is where he's currently uh, located, and this is what he's doing. He's functioning as a high priest. In Hebrews uh, 8, 1 through 6, it says, Now the main point in what has been said is this, that we have such a high priest who has taken his seat, notice, at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. And then he says, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, so it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who, who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God uh, when he was about to erect the tabernacle, for he says, he says, for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant, which has been in enacted with better promises. So he is right now in heaven functioning as, uh, as high priest. And this on behalf of those who are uh, his own in the world. <clears throat> Point number two, as our high priest, Christ is the bestower of spiritual gifts. Ephesians 4, uh, 7 through 11, it says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Verse 9, now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean? Except that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth. And he who descended himself is also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave some uh, as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers. So he has given really these gifted persons. And by the way, the thing about these gifts that are mentioned here, apostles, prophets, evangelists, uh, pastors, and teachers, which I take pastors and teachers here to be really a hyphenated gift because pastors are teachers. Uh, these are all communication gifts. These all have to do with uh, communicating uh, God's word to God's people. But he nonetheless, when he ascended, uh, he is also the bestower of spiritual gifts. Point number three, the ascended Christ as priest ever lives to make intercession for his own. He ever lives. And so this is mentioned in Hebrews 7, 25. It says, therefore, he is also able to save forever those who draw near to him and near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, the priest who functioned, uh, the high priest who functioned as intercessor, 
experience this thing called death. <laughs> and so he could not continue to function perpetually. But Christ, because he lives forever, uh, is always able to make intercession. And point number four, Christ now appears for his own uh, in the presence of God. So Hebrews 9.24, For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And so he's there to advocate for us. 1 John 2, 1 tells us this. John says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. It's never, never, never the will of God that we sin. Uh, that is correct. But what's the reality? The reality is that we do. We, we do sin. And so John says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have an advocate. And the word advocate here is a legal term. It actually translates the Greek word parakletos, parakletos. And that term is also used of the Holy Spirit, who is called as our comforter, the parakletos. But it's actually a legal term that was used in a court of law of one who really was an attorney, one who was your advocate before, uh, before a judge. And so Jesus uh, functions here. He says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And so this is what he is doing right now in heaven. Now, the present work of Christ on earth. Well, you say, well, that's what he's doing in heaven. What's he doing on the earth? Well, uh, even though he is in heaven, functioning as our high priest, uh, and he is functioning also as the bestower of spiritual gifts, because he continues to give uh, spiritual gifts and gifted persons. Uh, I have the gift of teaching. I didn't ask for it. Uh, don't earn it. Don't deserve it. But it is something that God gave to me, and I have to be uh, a responsible steward of what God has given to me, so it is important for me to study and, uh, and uh, to be able to communicate the things of Scripture. Now, there are some difficult passages in Scripture. I mean, if we're honest, we'll all admit that. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I, you know, as a teacher, you want to do the best that you can. But to understand that what Christ is doing now in heaven uh, for us, again, functioning as our high priest, uh, that he still continues to bestow spiritual gifts, uh, that he ever lives to intercede for us, and that he appears now uh, in the presence of God for us as our advocate. He's advocating for us. But then you say, okay, well, that's what he's doing in heaven. What's he doing on earth? Well, Jesus Christ is currently at work on earth, both with and in believers. In John chapter 14, verse 20, we realize that... Um, that when we look at a number of passages uh, in John, we realize that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit indwell us. A lot of times we put emphasis upon the Holy Spirit, but really all three members of the Godhead uh, indwell us. And, uh, and But the fact that we are indwelt by Christ is, is what is mentioned here in John 14, 20. Jesus says, In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. And I in you. And so this has to do with his current work in us. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Uh, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives where? But Christ lives in in me. And the life which I now live, I, uh, I live in the flesh by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. But again, demonstrating the point uh, that Christ uh, lives in us. Colossians 1.27, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ, notice, Christ in you, the hope of glory, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so this is his. Uh, this is what he's doing within us. And he is also the one who imparts life to those who believe in him. He is the one who imparts life to those who believe in him. Uh, Jesus says in John 10.10, 10, he says, The thief comes only to steal 
and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and to have it abundantly. And of course, another passage, uh, most notably on this, is John chapter 10, verse 28, where Jesus says, And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And I give eternal life. And the word give here translates the Greek verb uh, didomi, which is a present active indicative. And present tense means it is a right now truth. It is a right now truth. And so eternal life is not what we can have. It's what we have at the moment of faith in Christ. The active voice means the subject produces the action of the verb, which means that Jesus is the one who gives this to us. And the indicative mood is declarative for a statement of fact. This is a fact. It's not a feeling. It is a fact. And as Christians, we are to live by faith, not feelings. I like my feelings very much. Thank you. Uh, But my feelings um, uh, can misleading, (laughs) can mislead me. And how I feel does not define reality. God's word defines reality. And if God, uh, if something is revealed in Scripture to be true, it's true whether I feel like it or not. Uh, If I'm sick with a 102 degree fever and I haven't eaten in two days and I'm just feeling terrible, well, how I feel is inconsequential. I have eternal life. It's a fact, not a feeling. And so he says here, and I give eternal life. And by the way, you can't lose it. Uh, You cannot, uh, you know, and and I actually prefer the term forfeit. Some people say, oh, well, you lose your salvation. No, you know, that's almost seems to be haphazard. You know, like I, I misplace my car keys, you know, I I lose my car keys. Well, that's, that's, you know, just happens. Uh, I prefer the word forfeit because I think that's what people mean when they talk about loss of salvation. It's, it's, it's something they do to give it up. Uh, But here's the thing is if you can forfeit it, uh, then it's not eternal life, it's temporal life, uh, because it means that you can give it up. And um, it also teaches that really it becomes a form of works salvation. And people say, you know, even those who say, well, I'm saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Well, but you believe you can forfeit your salvation. Well, yes. Well, that would imply that you did something to earn it, or if not to earn it, that you must do something to keep it. And in that sense, it introduces works into your salvation and your eternal life. And so eternal life, again, is something that we receive from Christ at the moment of faith in Christ, and it cannot be forfeited. Uh, And so we are kept by the power of God. Now, if we turn away from the Lord, we can be subject to severe, severe divine discipline. Uh, and that can be really quite uh, quite uh, uh, painful. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 says, He whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, like a father his own son. And we can be subject to divine discipline uh, if we turn away from the Lord. And we can also forfeit eternal uh, rewards. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 3, verses 10 through 15, talks about our standing before the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Christ in heaven, uh, not to determine whether or not we'll get into heaven, but uh, to determine what rewards we will receive. And so those of us who uh, walked with the Lord, who learned his word and lived his word and and lived out the Christian life, well, that's gold, silver, and precious stones, and that will be rewarded. Uh, But for people who turned away from the Lord, who didn't learn his word, and who failed to walk with the Lord and to live out the Christian life, well, that's wood, hay, and straw, and that's going to be burned up, the big bonfire in the sky, and that'll be destroyed. And so they'll get into heaven uh, they will have, uh, they'll have no rewards. They'll get in. They'll have just their birthday suit on and the smoke will be singeing off their body and their hair. Uh, but they'll be in. They'll get in. They'll, they'll get in. They will be saved, yet so as through fire. But, uh, but as Christians, we're not working for our salvation. We're, we're working out our salvation, but not for our salvation. But uh, uh, the works that we produce in this life will earn us rewards in heaven. And that's part of what um, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10-15 demonstrate. 
And then also, I think it's uh, 2 John 1.8, uh, he talks about making sure that we have a full reward, a full reward uh, when we get into heaven. And so as Christians, uh, if we turn away from the Lord, what we forfeit, uh, well, what one, we subject ourselves to divine discipline, and two, we forfeit rewards uh, in the eternal state. Uh, and I've done videos on this and written on this before, uh, and you can chase down some of my material on that if you're interested in that. By the way, uh, divine discipline can be a really, really severe. In fact, I think it comes in stages. I think there's a warning discipline. I think there's an intensive discipline. And finally, it can result in physical death. 1 John 5, 16 and 17 talks about the sin unto death. The sin unto death. That is, and when we think of sin, we should really think of crime. We should almost put the word crime in there because it's a violation of law is what it is. But if we turn away from the Lord and we pursue a life of sin or, or criminal activity because we're disobedient to the Lord and we're not following his word and his will, well, uh, we can be subject to discipline. And there are some sins, just like there are some crimes that come with the death penalty chase a rabbit trail here for just a little bit. Uh, of the 613 commands uh, given under the Mosaic Law, if I remember correctly, 15 of them warranted the death penalty. 15 of them warranted the death penalty, if I remember correctly. Well, that right there tells you that not all sins are the same. Now, all sins are a violation of God's will, of his directives, but not all sins are equally egregious. And so there are some sins that warrant physical death physical death in which the believer uh, is to be put to death. In fact, there are times where God himself put people to death. You can think of Leviticus chapter 10 verses 1 and 2, uh, where Nadab and Abihu, uh, two of Aaron's sons, brought unauthorized fire into the tabernacle and God struck them dead. One can think of Uzzah when he reached out to touch the ark and God struck him dead. One can think of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5, who lied to the Holy Spirit and God struck them dead. <laughs> they were truly slain in the Spirit, or, or by God. Um, um, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 30, there were believers in the church who were partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And Paul says, for this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep, and sleep there being a euphemism for death. And so this speaks of believers who basically were put to death by the Lord. So listen, don't, don't ever take that lightly. I mean, just because you have eternal security doesn't mean that you can do what you want. And there, are, you know, when, when you believed in Christ, yes, you have eternal life that cannot be forfeited, that will never, never be taken away from you. But God expects us to grow up. He expects us to grow up. He expects us to advance to spiritual maturity. And there are three phases of, of, of the Christian life. Phase one is our justification. That is an act. It occurs at a moment in time in which you are born again. Uh, and that's a one and done deal. And you receive eternal life. You receive the gift of righteousness that can never be taken from you. You are eternally secure. You cannot forfeit your salvation. Phase two of the Christian life is our discipleship. This is from the moment that we uh, uh, turn to faith in Christ until we leave this world by death or by rapture. And that is our spiritual growth, uh, our, our moving towards spiritual maturity. And, um, and so when we think about phase two of the Christian life, this is our walk with the Lord. Now, you cannot, uh, again, undo your salvation. You have eternal life. You have the gift of righteousness that cannot be forfeited. And, uh, and it's because of that that Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. You will never face the lake of fire. Please, please, please understand this. Uh, the lake of fire is not your home. Faith in Christ, one and done. You turn to faith in Christ. You believe in him, believing he died for you, was buried, raised again on the third day. You trust in him and him alone. And at that moment, you have eternal life and you are forever secure in heaven. But the quality of your life in heaven uh, it depends on how you live out this life because some will receive rewards and some will not. And so how we live in this life determines our rewards in the eternal state. But that has to do with the quality of our life in the eternal state. So listen, this life matters. Oh, does it matter? 
And it matters not just in the eternal state, but it matters in here and now. It matters here and now because how we live touches the lives of other people. It touches our friends. It touches our co-workers. It touches our neighbors. It touches our parents. It touches our children. It touches our spouse. I mean, come on. To grow up and to be mature is not only the highest and the best calling that you can have as a Christian to grow up, but it also means that you are going to be a blessing in the lives of other people. And, um, and so it has impact right now, and it also has impact in the eternal state. And I, I want the best life. I absolutely want the best life. Uh, and then the third phase is our glorification. That's when we leave this world again, by, by death or by rapture. But once we get into heaven, once we get into the eternal state, we have new bodies minus the sin nature, and we will never uh, have to deal with that again. Uh, so when we're thinking about uh, eternal life, understand that eternal life is a gift from God to us. And by the way, if you have to pay for it, it's not a gift. It's not a gift. It means you bought it. But the scripture is very clear when it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift, the gift, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is screaming that truth. That is so, so clear. So, again, when Jesus says, And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And they will never perish. Um, and the word here for never uh, translates a double negative. It's uhme, uh, which is emphatic. Uh, it really, really drives the point uh, that they will never, never perish. <clears throat> so again, when we think about what Christ is doing on the earth, he is the one who imparts life to those who believe in him. 1 John 5, 12, he who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son does not have the life. Now, that's really kind of at the heart of the issue, isn't it? Do you have the Son? That's really the issue. That is the most important uh, question. When I'm talking with an unbeliever, uh, there are times where I will fra frame it in such a way where I will say, have you made the most important decision in your life? And, of course, they're thinking, well, the most important decision? Well, what is the most important decision in my life? Well, it's, it's, it's what have you done with Christ? Because if you believe in Christ, then you have the Son. He who has the Son has the life. And he who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. And that's really, really the issue there. And he is also the one who strengthens us to do his will. And so while we are on this earth, we are also strengthened by Christ to do his will. Ephesians 6.10 finally says, Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Uh, and so we are to be strong in the Lord. And then Ephesians 4.13, it says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Through him who strengthens me. And so Christ, uh, remember, he has ascended bodily into heaven. And while he is there, he is engaging in a priestly ministry. He is advocating uh, for us before the throne of the Father. And he is currently working on the earth. Uh, and he's working in his people, imparting life, and also strengthening us to do his will. So this is the current work of Christ that is going on from heaven, in heaven, and on the earth, and in us. All right, so let's move into the next section, next session here. And this is God the Son, His coming for His saints. His coming for His saints. Now, there is Bible prophecy concerning Jesus' return to earth. However, a distinction must be drawn between Jesus coming for His saints, which is the rapture, and Jesus coming with His saints at His second coming to reign for a thousand years. And so when we think about the second coming of Christ, we think about, uh, we think about his coming uh, to the earth. And by the way, at the rapture, uh, Jesus doesn't touch the earth. He descends, and then we are caught up to meet the Lord in the clouds. So that is our point of contact. He descends, we ascend, 
and then there's a, a, he does a U-turn and goes back to heaven, and we go with him. So that's his coming for his saints, and that is commonly understood as the rapture. But at the second coming, in Revelation 19, he descends, but he comes with his saints, and we're going to be coming with him. In fact, we're going to be dressed in white, and we're going to be uh, riding horses. So if you've never uh, ridden a horse before, well, you'll get your training. And, and that brings up another issue, that apparently there are animals in heaven. Uh, and if there's not at the moment, there will be uh, some horses, because we're going to be riding back on a horse with Christ at his second coming. So well, quite a picture, isn't it? And so uh, we will be coming back with him. But when we think about his second coming to reign for a thousand years, that is the that is the literal, physical, earthly reign of Christ from Jerusalem on the throne of David for a period of a thousand years. And we'll we'll develop that more here in the future. Now Jesus is now in heaven and he is preparing a place uh, for us to be with him there. John 14, 1 through 3. In John chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, those five chapters are one, one, uh, uh, one lengthy address. Well, 13, 14, 15, 16 is his address. 17 is his uh, prayer uh, to the Father. But it all occurs in the upper room. And it occurs on the night before Jesus' betrayal and crucifixion. He's literally hours from the cross. And this is his farewell address in those chapters. And he tells, and he's already told them, he says, look, I'm leaving. <laughs> now, this rocked their world, you know, because they're, they're, they're very troubled by this. They're very, very troubled by this. And Jesus says to them, he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Now, the word troubled here is a present passive imperative. Uh, do not right now, in the moment, let your heart be troubled. Passive voice means the subject receives the action of the verb. Active voice means he produces the action of the verb. Passive voice means he receives the action of the verb. So he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Do not receive trouble. By the way, this is also in the imperative mood, which the imperative mood is the mood of command. This is a directive. The Lord Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he's giving them an order. He's giving them an order. And the order is, do not let your heart be troubled. In other words, check your thinking, uh, check yourselves. Uh, don't don't let your thoughts get away from you. You know, in uh, and so he's 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 trying to stabilize their soul because they're upset, and he's going to do it by communicating divine viewpoint to them. But he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Uh, from the Greek verb terasso, uh, which is properly translated here as trouble. But he says, do not let your heart be troubled. Uh, in other words, don't let the information you heard upset you. Now, it's one thing to simply tell somebody, don't be troubled, because in one sense, they can't just uh, stop that function without substituting something in place of it. And so what happens here is he tells them, he says, do not let your heart be troubled, and then he gives them the solution to a troubled heart. He says, believe in God, believe also in me. Faith. Uh, look to God, look to me. Believe in God, believe also in me. In other words, let that be your focus. Focus on God, focus on me, uh, and this will uh, produce some stability within the soul. I think of the passage in Isaiah 26, 3, the mind that is stayed upon thee shall be kept in perfect peace because he trusts in thee. The mind that is stayed upon thee shall be kept in perfect peace because he trusts in thee. So when our mind is upon some troubling news or some events of this world, it causes disruption within ourselves, within our souls. But when we, when, we, when we address that by focusing our attention upon the Lord, when we put our minds upon Him, then we have that peace that comes from faith, from looking to God. And for those of you that uh, have lived out the Christian life and have uh, walked in faith, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, now, as soon as we look away from the Lord and begin to think upon the troubling news or the, just the affairs of this world, then by our decision, we forfeit that peace. So focus, mental attitude, very, very important in the Christian life, very important. You have to be able to think under pressure. You have to be able to think God's word under pressure. So when you hear troubling news, that's, that's fine. It, it can cause disruption. That's just part of the human experience. 
Uh, but 2 Corinthians 10.5 says that we are bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. We're bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So we are, in effect, uh, thinking about what we think about. We are aware that we are going in a certain direction, that there's a disruption going on. Well, emotion follows thought like a, like a trailer follows a truck. Emotion never operates on its own. So we have this uh, emotional uh, disruption going on within us because we've received some news and it's troubled us. And so we're, we're, we're feeling troubled within ourselves. And so <clears throat> we have to realize, okay, well, I'm feeling this way because I'm thinking a certain way. So when you get back and you can think about what you think about and you can engage in a form of uh, cognitive diffusion in which you can think about what it is that you're thinking about and you can diffuse those thoughts. Uh, you can isolate them. You can take that, that aberrant sinful thought and you can, you can set it off to the side and you can step back and you can say, that's what that is, you little troublemaker, you. You're causing me trouble. I see what's going on there. And so you look at that troubling thought, you isolate it and you wrap it up in faith. You take faith and you wrap up that troubling thought and you shift your thoughts. You shift your thoughts away from the thing that is troubling you, and you put your thoughts back upon the Lord. That's focus. That's faith. That's living it out. So you have to get hold of your thoughts. Again, 2 Corinthians 10.5, we're bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So he says to them, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. See, see what he's doing here is he's getting them to focus. He's getting them to turn away from the thing that is troubling them, the news that they heard that Jesus is leaving. That upset them. It was very upsetting to them. But he's, uh, he's addressing that within them because he loves them. He cares about their stability. He cares about their cognitive and emotional stability. So he's, uh, he's giving them what they need to focus upon. And this is uh, believe in God, uh, believe also in me. Uh, so very helpful, very practical. And then he goes into verse 2. He says, in my Father's house. Now, he's talking about in heaven. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. And he says, look, if it were not so, I would have told you. Uh, he says, for I go. So he's leaving. Because again, remember earlier, he told him that he's leaving. Now, they've, given, they've been given the what, but not the why. He's given them the what, but not the why. But now he's given them the why. Uh, he says, uh, he says, for I go to prepare a place for you. In other words, I'm leaving you. Yes, that's true. And I'm not leaving you as orphans because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to, uh, to be with you and to be in you. Uh, and he's giving them divine revelation. He's, he's given them the information they need that they can frame their situation. What's going on? What's going to happen with the cross, with his ascension? And so they have divine viewpoint, which allows them to be able to uh, again, deal with their stressful situation. And he says, look, I'm going to prepare a place for you. But notice what he says in verse 3. If I go and prepare a place for you, if I go and prepare a place for you, now you have to, you have to think about this. You have to follow the bouncing ball here. Stay with me. If I go and prepare a place for you, now where is he going? He's going to heaven. That's where he's going. He's going to heaven. So don't miss that. He's going to heaven. He says, if I go to heaven and prepare a place for you in heaven. Notice what he says here. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, where's he going to be? In heaven, there you may be also. So he's going to heaven to prepare a place, and he's going to come, and he's going to come again and receive, he says, and receive you to myself where? In heaven. Now, again, this is important. And you have, to, you have to stay with me on this. When Christ comes at his second coming, he's coming to the earth to establish his earthly kingdom. His earthly kingdom. And so that is going to be his target, his destination. What he's talking about here is not coming to the earth. He's talking about coming to receive believers to go back with him to heaven. So again, if I go and prepare a place for you, again, think of where's he going? He's going to heaven, and he's going there to prepare a place, and he says, and I will come again. That means he is coming back. I will come again. He is coming back. I will come again and receive you to myself. So we're going to be 
uh, we're, we're, he's going to come back and he's going to receive us. He's going to take us to himself that where I am, there you may be also. So again, this is a rapture passage. It is a passage that demonstrates that, that believers, when Christ returns, we're going to go back with him to heaven. Now, Paul describes Jesus' return for the church uh, in which we shall be caught up uh, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13-18, and he uses the Greek word harpazo. Harpazo. Now, people say, well, the word rapture isn't in the Bible. Well, that's true. That's true. The word rapture is not, but neither is the word trinity in the Bible. Uh, but it is nonetheless a biblical teaching. It is nonetheless a biblical teaching. And, well, where does the word rapture come from? Well, it comes from the Latin word rapturo, rapturo, uh, which communicates the idea of the Greek word harpazo, which means to seize or to catch up, to seize or to catch up. So we will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, this is what Paul is talking about in 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. He says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, that is, Christians who have died, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Now, as Christians, we do grieve. Um, you know, my mom passed away nearly two years ago on uh, February 16th, uh, 2021. Uh, Here it is. Well, today's February 1st, 2023. So it's been nearly two years, and I was with her bedside uh, when uh, at the hospital. My wife and I both were there when she took her last breath. And of course, her last breath here was followed by her first breath in heaven. <laughs> and one can imagine what a breath that must have been. Um, quite magnificent. <laughs> uh, but did, was there a grieving? Sure there was. I mean, come on, when you when you lose a loved one, my wife and I had to, we, we had to put our puppy dog down here uh, a few months ago. And she had been our dog for 13 years, our little Havanese. A beautiful dog, beautiful dog, a real, a real blessing from God to us. Well, again, there's grieving, a grieving. But here, when when we lose, but we do not, but unlike, um, not unlike unbelievers, we do not grieve as do unbelievers who have no hope. What's our hope? Our hope is that we're going to see our loved one again. We know that it's a temporary arrangement, uh, that we're just separated for a brief period of time. So we grieve, but we do not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do you believe that? I do. The scripture is very clear on this, and the word of God is true and can be trusted. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in in Jesus. So there's going to be a reunion in the clouds. Verse 15, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive, now this would be alive at the time of the rapture, we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Now this coming is the rapture. This is where we're going to meet the Lord in the air. This is not the second coming. That's a, that's a separate event. Uh, but uh, And there will be a rapture generation. I think very much the world stage is right now being set. Uh, there's tremendous evidence, because uh, you think about future events, you think about after the rapture of the church, well, the Antichrist is going to rise to power, and he is going to broker a peace treaty, uh, a contract with Israel, unbelieving Israel's in the land. Well, Israel has to be in the land in order for that to happen. Hmm, Israel's in the land, isn't it? May 1948 when that happened, and they're still there. So Israel in the land, check. Uh, the Antichrist is going to try to establish, well, he's, he's going to establish a one-world government. And the world right now, the language is very much uh, among world rulers moving in that direction, check. Well, he's also going to establish a one-world economy, because no man can buy or sell except him who has the mark of the beast, check. He's also going to establish a one-world religion, check because that discussion's going on as well. And so there's things that are going on right now with the world stage being set that, I'll tell you, it's, it's uh, to me, it seems like the rapture could occur any minute. 
I mean, it really could happen literally any minute. And so when I think about the world stage being set, I think right now that we are living at a time which, again, it, God, it could all fall apart and God could uh, uh, set the world stage again 200 years from now. That, that's true. Uh, but uh, we've never seen the world stage uh, stage so set up like it is today. And so it just makes me think that the next prophetic event that we're looking for is the rapture of the church. That's the next prophetic event. So he says uh, back in the verse 15 here, For this we say to you by, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, that is, those of us who are part of the rapture generation, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ. Now don't miss that. That prepositional phrase, in Christ, in Christo, is very, very theologically important because it speaks to Christians. That is our uh, position as part of the body of Christ, that we are said to be in Christ. And the dead in Christ will rise first, so the graves will be opened, and the bodies of those in the graves will come out, uh, and they will be reunited because at the resurrection, <clears throat> there's a reuniting of the body. And if somebody was cremated or if somebody died uh, uh, at sea or if somebody died in an explosion and there was nothing left, well, God's able to uh, recollect all of those molecules and bring that body back together. So don't, don't worry, God, God, God had taken care of. Um, but he says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. Now, caught up, there's our word. There's harpazo. And, uh, and it means that we will be caught up uh, together with them, where? In the clouds. Uh, because that's where we're going to meet the Lord, is in the clouds. Uh, we will meet the, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So that's where we're going to meet him. Now, uh, some people would say, because there's uh, covenant theologians, uh, who do not hold to a future tribulation or millennial kingdom. And they believe that the next event is just the second coming of Christ and the, then the eternal state, new heavens, new earth. I think the biblical teaching is clear that there's going to be a rapture, a seven-year tribulation, followed by a 1,000-year millennial kingdom, then the eternal state. And that is what is being set forth in these lessons uh, as dispensational theology. Now, again here, it's going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Uh, so we are going to be caught up. Now, the covenant would say, well, we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and then we are going to turn around and come back to the earth. We're just going to come back to the earth with the Lord. So Lord's coming. We're going to be caught up to meet him. And then the direction is going to be this way, down towards the earth. Whereas the dispensational view is the understanding that we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and then the Lord is going to do a U-turn, go back to heaven, and we're going to go back with him. So how people understand these passages is going to be a little bit different uh, with regard to the uh, study of eschatology. But we're going to be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, Paul explains um, to the church at Corinth that the changing of our bodies at the Lord's return is a mystery. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53, he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Now, a mystery is not a whodunit. The word mystery translates the Greek word mousterion. It translates the Greek word mousterion. And mousterion refers to something that was not revealed in the Old Testament, but is revealed here for the first time. Don't miss that. The word mousterion refers to something that was not known in the Old Testament, but is being introduced and revealed here for the first time. So this is new revelation. This is, this is new uh, and so he says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. I give you something that was not known before, but I'm telling you right now, brand new information. Listen up. Listen. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. Hmm. In other words, we're not going to face death 
physical death, but we will be what? Changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. So when we are caught up, if the rapture were to occur right now, I'm happy with that. If the rapture were to occur right now, this body in its current form would be changed. And I would have a new body, (laughs) one that is not subject to sin and death or decay. And so I will have that perfect body for all of eternity. All right, so let's talk about various views on the rapture. Now, I do not have it here in these notes that I am using here for this video and for this uh, podcast, but if you download the notes, I have a chart in there, and I'm going to recommend that you go to that chart because it's a visual that I put together uh, to help you understand the various views on the rapture. And there's other charts you could use. Dr. Tommy Ice has uh, uh, charts uh, for eschatology, for prophecy, that are just brilliant, and I generally defer to him on uh, eschatological matters. Um, But anyway, let's look at various views on the rapture. There is the pre-tribulation rapture. This means that the church is taken out of the world before the tribulation begins. Uh, That, I believe, is the correct view. The pre-tribulation rapture view is the correct view. Now, I have Christian friends who hold to uh, different views. And... um, And uh, we have very loving and gracious conversations. Uh, No need to uh, get all fired up about some of these things. Uh, But this is the view that the church is taken out of the world before the tribulation begins. And you think about uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, uh, 1, uh, verses 10. It says, And to wait for his Son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Who rescues us from the wrath to come. And then uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God has not destined us for wrath. We are not going to be part of the, we are not going to experience the tribulation. We're not. There is the partial rapture view. Uh, And this view teaches that only believers who faithfully watch for the Lord's return will be raptured out of the world before the tribulation. Uh, I think this view confuses the second coming of Christ with the rapture of the church. There is the mid-tribulation rapture view, and that is that the church is taken out of the world in the middle of the tribulation. This view, in the pre-wrath rapture view, ignores biblical passages that teach that God will spare the church from wrath and tribulation. Then there is the pre-wrath rapture view, and that is that the church is taken out of the world just before God's wrath is greatest. And then there is the post-tribulation rapture view, which says that the church is raptured up as Christ is returning to earth at his second coming. This view seeks to merge the rapture of the church with the second coming of Christ. So you have these differing views uh, uh, with regard to the rapture of the church. And then you have the covenant theologians, uh, some of my Reformed friends, uh, uh, that we have very rich theological discussions, and we agree for most part uh, on most doctrines, uh, on theology proper, on Christology, pneumatology, uh, and so on. <clears throat> Where we differ uh, bas- basically has to do with ecclesiology and Israelology, how we understand Israel and the church, and on eschatological matters, uh, that is, with regard to things like the rapture of the church and the tribulation and millennial kingdom. So, <clears throat> anyway, these uh, these various views, I think, are helpful for us to understand. And again, I'm touching on these lightly. Remember, this is a survey of theology. We're not getting into the weeds. Uh, that is for more advanced uh, courses at the master's and the doctoral level. And certainly there's books out there uh, that I would highly recommend uh, to study these issues uh, more more deeply. But uh, anyway, we're just covering these lightly just to introduce you to these doctrines and to the biblical passages behind them. So that will close out this uh, lesson. And next time we will pick up on God the Son, His coming with His saints with his saints. And so this has to do with the second coming of Christ. 
So I thank you very much for taking the time to uh, listen to this lesson. I hope that it has been helpful to you, and I wish you a blessed day.